Welcome everyone at this knowledge exchange. It's called Native Advertisement by Niche Media. Thank you for joining. Um, so let me first tell you a little bit of background of this initiative. This exchange is part of a series of exchanges between media houses. They're funded by UNESCO, carried out by Free Press Unlimited. And the initiative is focused on contributing to media viability by offering media houses a platform to exchange more intimate knowledge about specific aspects of their business models. Um, and to allow other media to benefit from this as well, we have a recording uh, that will be published on Free Press Unlimited's website. Um, so today, uh, I think we have a few participants present. If there are any questions, you can just put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and me or my co-host Isabel O'Farrell will take those questions at the end of this um, exchange. Um, so today's conversation, as I said, discusses native advertisement. And we have with us Devi Asmarani, who is the editor-in-chief of Magdalene in Indonesia, uh, as well as Jeplin Pashriga, who is the founder and CEO of Feminism in India. And we will focus on how digital media can use their own branding and that of clients to make an income that is independent of grant funding. Um, so I will just focus, I will give the floor now to Devi and Chaplin. Um, maybe Devi, you can start with introducing yourself and Magdalene. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, hi, everyone. So um, as uh, Evelyn has said, I, um, I'm actually the co-founder of Magdalene.co and uh, right now the chief editor, as well as the CEO. Um, uh, Magdalene is an online magazine. We call it magazine because we don't uh, produce as many content as would say like a news site. So we are an online magazine uh, based in Jakarta. Uh, we are bilingual and we focus on covering issues from politics, society, uh, culture, and uh, everything through a gender perspective. Our mission is to educate and empower our readers and actually also help the our the readers who are mostly young women to navigate uh, life uh, uh, and make informed choices and also to push for a uh, kind of more uh, equal society. Um, we were established in 2013 and uh, our readers are mostly uh, Gen Z and uh, as well as millennials and like 70% to uh, 70 to 75% are women and the rest are men. So I will start there, Evelyn, and t uh, yeah, off to you, Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Pasricha, and I am the founder and CEO of Feminism in India, which is, uh, I think I can just say everything that Devi said, but in India, <laughs> because we are a very, very similar platform uh, founded in 2014, uh, also bilingual, uh, we publish in English and Hindi. And uh, we are also a feminist magazine. Uh, same reason we don't publish as much content and we also do not cover news uh, per se, but more provide a news commentary on uh, everyday social, political, cultural, and current affairs happening in the country from a feminist lens. Uh, when we say feminist lens, we also um, ensure that it is a broader term to include minorities as well. So uh, not just gender, but also talk about other intersections and other social identities, especially in a uh, you know, very contextual to India is caste, class, um, religion, uh, disability, uh, sexual identity, gender identity, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we also create, uh, apart from our uh, publication, which we have in two languages, we also create multimedia content. So that is, for example, videos, uh, podcasts, and a lot of um, visual social media content like infographics, posters, uh, et cetera. Uh, we also have a young audience between the age group of 18 to 24 and 25 to 34. So that is uh, millennials and Gen Z, uh, given the fact that India in itself is a young country where more than I would say 60% of our population is under the age group of 35. 
So our uh, audience is very much uh, in that demographic. And um, because we are bilingual and the way that we work with both our languages is that we treat them as independent publications. So we have separated all the properties. Uh, that means the website, the social media accounts, the YouTube channels. So they all have their own website, own Twitter, Facebook, Insta, YouTube, etc. accounts. So this way we are able to, um, I would say, uh, you know, track our audience better in the way that we see that the English audience, sorry, the English website has a more urban audience and based in metropolitan cities of India, which is Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, uh, versus the Hindi website. Uh, and Hindi is one of the official languages of India. We have about 22 official languages. Uh, and um, the Hindi website is, uh, you know, uh, gets audience more from the northern um, part of India, which is where Hindi is spoken uh, and is the official language of about nine to 10 states in India. Uh, so we see this kind of uh, audience demographic on both our websites and also that the Hindi website uh, has a penetration beyond urban areas and reaches semi-urban and as well as rural areas. Uh, we are a all women's team of about 10 people and we have been operational since I would say about four years. And yeah, I think that's it for now. And we will go into the business models later. Thank you, Jacqueline. Wow. Um, I'm really, uh, I really admire the fact that you have two different, like you treat the English and Hindi version differently. When you say 10 people team, no, before we go into the business model, can I just uh, explore this? When you say 10 people, does that mean like for both languages or for each of the language or, and is that just editorial or that includes like a kind of business team and all that? Uh, thanks, uh, Devi. So it includes everybody. So the 10 people includes everybody from editorial to business to campaigns and uh, social media and video content. Uh, because we are a young startup, so a lot of people have a lot of people multitask and have different responsibilities uh, from social media to video production. It's a small team. So it's, you know, all hands in kind of a situation. And uh, regarding your first question, so yes, I actually went through your website and we used to have a similar, uh, you know, structure where the Hindi, uh, it was just a section on the English website, uh, like a category on the English website. And for about, I would say two, three years, um, but we realized that, um, you know, it's not getting its own due in the sense. And also because for us, uh, these are uh, like, as I said, India has about 22 official languages. So we are also a country which, uh, you know, uh, whose DNA is uh, multi, uh, is multilingual and multicultural. So uh, we realized that we are missing a really huge audience and also the English is overpowering the Hindi because it gets lost in the English website. So it's just one section in the English website. And, you know, half of the people don't know that we also publish in Hindi. So we, we really wanted to separate the mother and child and like, you know, give the child a more independent identity uh, so that it's not, you know, uh, just seen as some small thing. Uh, but so we separated this about, I would say 2.5 years back. Uh, however, we are still, uh, you know, the English website is still much bigger in terms of the content because it's older than the Hindi website. So we are still struggling with bringing the Hindi publication uh, at the same level, both in terms of the content that we create, but also the exposure and visibility that the English website has. Uh, so we are still, we are still, I would say, working on that and struggling with that a little. But yes, um, I think that to if 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 any publication uh, wants to uh, target a specific audience which is tied to a linguistic identity then i would definitely suggest to separate it uh, otherwise one um, website will definitely overpower the other and the other will get lost so so uh, so those 10 people for for the two websites or is yeah, that what you were saying as well. Okay, okay. It's wow. the entertainment total. Right. So it's actually um, 
the opposite of what my, uh, of what we have done. When we started, uh, we actually started in English because my background is writing in for English publication and the, my co uh, co co uh, founder also. But uh, as we went along, as we progressed, um, and then it uh, it was I think it was uh, 2014. It was political year for Indonesia, and there was a lot of you know bickering, a lot of uh, polarization, and so we started uh, writing a lot of political stories. And then some people are saying, "Look, I think Indonesian. Uh, I think you would get a lot more reach if you write this in Indonesian." So we started translating. But then uh, we found out that yes, we had a lot more reach. I think because Indonesia, uh, um, we, the the population of people who speak English is not as as much as in India. The proportion is not as big as in India. So, so there are a lot more people reading in Indonesian. So, um, right now our Indonesian content is probably. 80% compared to the English content. So what we used to have Indonesia rubric, like one category of Indonesia version. Now it's the other way around. So now it's English um, as one of the categories. And it's not a mirror of our website. It's just like some contents are in English, some are uh, translated and, you know, so it's something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think um, our, uh, problem is a little different uh, so it's not that there are there are more english speakers in india it's it is the opposite there are more uh, indian language speakers uh, in mm -hmm. india but um, because english is something that uh, and just to go back a little in history as a country we have uh, we have because of colonialism uh, it is very much associated to one's uh, social class identity. So what kind of school you went to uh, and how good you are, uh, you know, um, at speaking English is very much tied to that. So the demographic that the English website receives more traffic from urban metropolitan cities is because a certain class of people live in these cities and work and speak in English versus so I feel with us, the problem is not that there aren't Hindi speakers in the country. It's just that we have not been able to reach those Hindi speakers. And also feminism as a topic, again, is uh, seen as a Western concept uh, and as West oriented or something that the West has uh, brought to India or to you know Asian countries. Uh, which is not true because there were uh, there have been you know women's rights movements um, in India and I'm sure in other countries as well. Um, even if the term feminism was not something that was uh, used or you know uh, known, but it's difficult to uh, because the linguist linguist identity is also very much associated with the cultural identity. So it's difficult to um, you know talk about these issues uh, in this language and also uh, and make people understand that this is not a western concept or you know we are not trying mm -hmm. to uh, because feminism is seen as this bad thing which will destroy families and culture mm -hmm. and like basically women empowerment is seen as if women are empowerment families will be destroyed and our culture will be because the uh, culture is very much associated to you know oppressing women uh, so uh, yeah so then uh, it, it becomes difficult to talk about those issues uh, mm -hmm. because of these I would say more cultural reasons than uh, and and there's definitely a language barrier that I was discussing with Evelyn uh, before uh, this that uh, so many words because especially the discourse on gender and sexuality is again very west dominated like for example mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a word for the we don't have a word for lesbian or um, mm -hmm. you know or intersectionality or heteronormativity like these these words don't have a word for in hindi so it becomes again difficult to explain to people what does being bisexual means, you know? What does being a lesbian mean? What does being a gay mean? So uh, it becomes both a linguistic as well as a cultural ba uh, barrier to talk about gender and feminism and women's rights and issues in that socio-cultural belt. Wow, that's interesting. And I think it's the 
similarly in Indonesia, um, you know, the same problem, the same misconception of feminism still strongly exists. Uh, now, um, you know, your name is feminism in India, which doesn't get any clearer than that, <laughs> right? It doesn't get any self-explanatory than that. And at the same time, you're saying that there's still also uh, a lot of baggage, a lot of stigma attached to feminism and a lot of cultural uh, misunderstanding or misperception. How does this translate to like your business? Like maybe we can talk a little bit about your business model um, uh, because, and, and maybe you can explain, are, are you actually a nonprofit or are you a for-profit company? Yeah, so, um... We are a for-profit company. Um, we haven't started making any profits yet. <laughs> but Same we here. Are, <laughs> but we are registered as a for-profit company. Uh, the issue in India is also, so now, you know, with the rise in entrepreneurship, uh, there I would say there's a new um, category of uh, companies or organizations that has come up, which I describe as social enterprise, which are, these are companies, but uh, who have a business model, but they work for a social cause. Um, and this is what we are, we are, or that's how I would uh, describe us, that we are a social enterprise. The problem is that in India, uh, there is no such legal recognition for such an enterprise, which is working on a social cause, but has a business model. Uh, so you can either be a complete NGO, which means that you, you know, you are completely dependent on charity and donations and grants, or you are a, a profit making company. However, um, we are neither uh, because we do have business models, but we haven't reached that stage where we have broken even or where we are able to self sustain. So we are dependent on grants, but we are also not making any profits. So it's a little unfortunate situation where you don't have an option to uh, have that kind of a legal recognition. Uh, but coming to your question, yes, we are registered as a for-profit company. Um, and uh, currently we are dependent both on funding and grants that we receive plus our business model. We have tried multiple uh, things and uh, also experimented and seen what works and what doesn't work. And for us right now at this time, I can say that um, what works the most is uh, content creation and brand collaborations that I would say has been the most successful. Uh, Apart from, I mean, raising funds via grants, we don't do donations or individual uh, fundraising because we have realized that we need to focus, given that we are a very small team, we need to focus on the ROI, uh, uh, on the effort and time spent. And uh, we have realized that doing things like uh, individual fundraising, or uh, we also experimented with selling company merchandise. Uh, and I saw that you also have a store and you know, uh, we also uh, experimented with selling t-shirts and tote bags and mugs, which have a feminist or like a you know, cool gender uh, related messaging. And it's not very successful in, in our experience. And also the kind of effort the, into the production and marketing that it needs, the return is very small. So uh, just uh, like just to speak in a standard currency so that it's easier for everybody. So let's say we have to sell a t-shirt at $10 or $15. Uh, and there's a lot of effort that goes into the production of it, the messaging, the design, the conceptualization, the marketing, the sale. Uh, handling everything but the return is a $15 t-shirt and uh, it's not like we are selling thousands and thousands of $15 t-shirt right we are selling just 50 $15 t-shirts so um, so the effort is way too high versus the return is not so great so we have realized that store is out of the question um, we still do have it on our website but it's not something that we will be focusing on a lot in future we also have tried the membership program. And um, I think you're also aware because I actually got to know about Magdalene from Splice. Uh, I was talking to someone at Splice and they told me about, uh, so even before Evelyn reached out, I was aware of your organization and uh, yeah, I used to follow some of the updates. 
Um, so we launched a membership program um, earlier this year. And a membership program is kind of in between of a donation and a subscription, which means that um, you're still asking people to become a member and have like an annual uh, subscription thing, um, which they renew every year. However, um, you are not putting your content behind a paywall. So our content is still free. So, but uh, it's like the entire basis of it is on, uh, you know, good cause and support uh, plus some extra benefits. So it's like, um, let's say you are a member and Evelyn isn't, and both of you still can read uh, every, every piece of content on our website and watch every video. However, you will maybe receive some extra benefits like uh, our exclusive merchandise or a special newsletter, which Evelyn won't because she hasn't signed up to become a member. So this is something that we launched earlier this year in January. And again, I would say uh, the return on investment is not as good. It is a lot of work. Um, for a very major amount. Again, you know, we have kept the membership pricing very minimal uh, because we wanted to scale it. Uh, but, it, you know, that's not something that is really happening, I would say. So again, like, you know, let's say your annual membership is at $15. Um, but to sustain and sell that annual membership for $15, there's a lot of work that goes behind. So we have realized it's better to focus on brand collaborations and content creation. And I think um, Evelyn sent you some content that we created in the form of videos and articles. And that is a one-time task, takes much less time and we can price it uh, higher than, you know, let's say a t-shirt or a membership uh, program. I'll stop for now and then we can come back to more. We experimented with a couple of more things and I'll talk about that, but I would love to know your mm -hmm. thoughts on this as well as your business model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I also saw the membership part and I was interested in knowing that, but we can talk about that a little later, but uh, maybe I will also kind of introduce what like our business model is. Uh, honestly, um, Hera and I, Hera is my uh, co-founder, um, we actually didn't come from, didn't have any business background. We, we've been in journalism for so long. So, you know, and, and we, we know content, we develop content, we, we do all this stuff uh, without really thinking of how we can make this sustainable. At the time, we, we just thought we need to build our brand. And for the first few years, that's what we did. We work other stuff. We, we were still doing our, you know, maybe two or three jobs even, and we run this. Uh, and we have maybe a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of um, uh, interns. And then um, at some point, I thought that, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't, you know, we should, we shouldn't just use our own money. So what we did was uh, we created a business unit at the time. Uh, it's named, uh, we call it Working Room, which is basically a creative agency. The reason why we did this, we did this was because I had been a, a freelancer for some time by then, and I had been working for, you know, doing a lot of freelance writing, copywriting, media stuff, media uh, consulting stuff for from uh, companies corporation to like, uh, you know, international donor a uh, agencies like UNICEF and World Bank and things like that. So I've, I've done a lot of these things and I know there's some market for that. So I said, let's just bring our clients into Magdalene, into working room. And, you know, we either we do it or we hire freelancers to do it. So that was our first business unit, and 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 it managed to give us some uh, some uh, revenue so that we can pay uh, you know our staff at the time or interns and not pay us, and then um, and then like you said uh, we are also still struggling because you know we didn't have people uh, basically to run the business side. Uh, and so um, we were working, we were looking for grants. And finally, we, uh, we had our break. We had our big break in 2018. We had a grant from uh, MDIF, uh, Media Development Investment Fund. Uh, that started in 2019. Um, uh, and then in 2000, so from 2019 to 2020, we got uh, some grants, which enabled us to actually hire ourselves, pay ourselves so that we can leave our other job. 
and then also to create a team and you know to have a little office uh, in a co-working space and things like that and from there uh we can actually start kind of um to to have uh, uh to develop other revenue streams. But maybe before I go there, we actually had started a little bit at the time, uh, even before we had our own team, we, you know, we had some friends who helped us. We would create events and we would find some sponsors and, you know, uh, and we get a little bit of money from there or uh, there would be some, uh, you know, maybe some entities, you know, some small, um, small kind of companies or entrepreneurs who who paid us for uh you know sponsored content to you know to write things and and stuff like that so so we have that but it's still very very small and uh and because we didn't have that many staff we didn't we didn't have as many output and so our traffic was also quite small so we couldn't really sell ourselves to agencies and things like that but uh, since 2019, we have a little bit more people and we, uh, our output uh, increase and, and, and we can uh, have a, a small uh, team or maybe one person uh, business, one business person and also one community person. And actually this community person is the, uh, the one that really helps us because this community person is the one that bridge between the editorial, the content and the, uh, and the business side. Um, so what, what happens is, um, like you, we, we also, uh, a lot of our revenues now comes from collaboration with brand or com or or uh, organizations. Uh, like for example, one of our uh, biggest uh, one of our revenues this year comes from our campaign on on uh, anti sexual uh, violence campaign with a beauty brand that has been known for you know for their kind of more social values and and we've also worked with for example like un women or undp and organizations like that uh, i think as our name uh, uh, continues to grow uh, people start to look or you know these brands and this uh, organizations start to look at us as uh, something that is worth investing in or partnering in and especially if they have some, uh, some uh, maybe one of the condition is that they have to work with the women owned companies or uh, that they have to work with a company that has this gender values and things like that. So, so uh, yeah, a lot of it now comes from uh, that kind of partnership, but it's still, to me, it's still, you know, I, as, a, as a founder and the CEO of, of this company, I'm still uh, nervous, you know, every time a campaign is over, I'm still thinking, now what, you know, because I don't, I don't have that big of a team to actually go out there and pursue this thing. A lot of these things come to us because we are the only, maybe, the only person or at least the first uh, the only entity or the first entity that does this that is in this space that talks about feminism the way we do and talks about gender issues the way we do um and uh to answer uh, uh on uh, one of the things that you were saying is a merchandise yes we did try that that was also before uh, even before we had our team uh, our big team we started doing that and I agree with you. It's a it's a lot of investment in energy, in time, and in money as well. Because you know, uh, if you want to have, if you want to have it, uh, if you know, if you want to kind of, I mean, not even scale up, but you know, you want to produce so that you get some discount, then you have to have, you know, you have to produce a certain amount. But then there is a question of, you know, investment you know, a sizing and then if it's a t-shirt or a piece of clothing and then stock, where, where are you going to stock these things? And then if people order, then you have to actually be in charge of that. I was, I've actually done it myself as a CEO. I've like handled that myself, send it, went to, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, FedEx or whatever. And, you know, so it's a, it is a lot of work. So right now I think that, uh, that side is actually, um, uh not really we're not really handling that although we put it on on uh, one of the online shops in indonesia but you know we're not doing any marketing on that you know if somebody orders that's good if not you know we're not really doing much for that so 
Yeah, and maybe can I ask you with the membership, uh, you said that um, it's, it's really hard to, or how, how does it, I mean, but, but when you say that it's not really picking up well, or um, is that because culturally in India, there's at least for the, for the general or for your the targeted audience, that a uh, paying subscription for media content is not really a thing or what do you think thanks devi that was uh, really good to know that we have similar struggles and i will uh, respond to each uh, one by one so um i'm glad that you know you have been uh, you got a grant from mdif and have been able to now work with big organizations like un women and undp Another uh, thing that were, has worked for us, uh, so as I said, we are both dependent on grants as well as our business models. When it comes to grants, uh, we also have um, one uh, current grant that is going on, which is uh, by a media philanthropy organization based in India itself. However, another suggestion that I would like to make is to also explore uh, women's organizations who make uh, funding because uh, you and us, we both work at the intersection of gender and media. So apart from media grants, I would also uh, ask you, uh, I mean, suggest you to look at um, women's funds because that has worked for us. Uh, so our funders are both uh, media organizations, but also women's organizations. Uh, coming to merchandise, uh, I swear I have packed the merchandise myself <laughs> i have like right right i'm at my desk and right here i have the wrapping paper and the you know and the tape and scissors and everything like just kept here on my side because i have done that myself and again we are working from home so the entire stock is at my place uh in this very room in the cupboards and it is a nightmare because uh, you have to do from, you are the CEO, but you're also the intern. You are everything of the organization. So you have to do everything. Um, so yeah, merchandise again for us also, I don't think we would be putting any more effort into it. Uh, it's there on our website. If somebody buys it, great. Uh, because we have some stock left over and we, I, I really do want to get rid of it since it's taking space in my home. <laughs> but yeah, same. We wouldn't be doing anything further on that. Um, campaigns is what has worked for us as well. We have also worked with brands. Uh, so one of the biggest brands that we worked with is Tinder, the uh, matchmaking app. And uh, they wanted to have, and, and with these brands, as you said very correctly, we work on social messaging and not really on, uh, you know, go buy this of that brand or like go uh, download the app. That's not the kind of campaigns that we do. So we are very clear that the campaign has to be on social messaging. And with Tinder, because it's an online dating app, the social messaging was on the concept of online consent and rejection and how uh, our basic etiquettes of online dating, because a lot of women face uh, harassment uh, on such apps. So the campaign was very much part of was on this social messaging and not really on uh, go download Tinder and you know use Tinder for whatever purpose. Um, uh, same with uh, advertisements, uh, with display advertisements, we have the same problem is that because we don't uh, publish so much, so we don't have high traffic on the website and uh, to be able to attract um, advertisers, uh, you need to have high traffic. And uh, something else that I discussed with Evelyn in our previous call was that, um, I don't know if this stands true for Indonesia, but it is for India that um, advertisers prefers clicks from US, UK, Europe, and those countries uh, because they have a higher click through rate versus um, Indian uh, users or you know South Asian users. So uh, in our previous call, both me and Magdalene were on your website. Sorry, me and Evelyn were on uh, Magdalene's website, sorry. And uh, uh, Evelyn could see an advertisement uh, or display ad on the website and I couldn't. Uh, it, it wasn't been displayed to me. And we both discussed this at that time that uh, it is targeting someone based in Europe and not targeting someone based in India because 
um, because the person who is based in Europe will have a higher click through rate. And that's why, so that's also how display advertisements work. And we have been told that if you have more users from UK, US and Europe, you will get more money versus if you have more users from India, then you know it's the rates are not so great. So we realized that we don't want to, uh, we decided not to have ads because again, you know, it, it was just, uh, again, a lot of work on and not so much return, like it was peanuts and um, uh, yeah, so we decided not to do it. Uh, we haven't tried events and sponsors yet, but it's a model that I know that works because I know of a lot of organizations and media organizations, especially in India who have done this. Uh, with sponsored content, we have done a few, but not so much because when it comes to sponsored content, we have to be really, really selective of what we are publishing. Uh, so half the times, most most of the requests that we receive are about, uh, you know, uh, like topics that do not match our niche at all. Um, like I remember we got an email the other day about a tire company. They want to sell tires. And I was like, okay, this, this doesn't match our niche and we have to focus it on gender. So for us, sponsored content becomes extremely selective and it's not something that works a lot for us. Um, so yeah, so just like coming back, um, the content creation and campaigning and you know brand collaborations is what works uh, the most for us. Another thing that we tried last year was if you uh, have seen our website, you will see there's a job board on the website. Uh, so this job board we launched last year um, and the idea was to um, uh, to le like, let's say um, uh, Free Press Unlimited wants to hire someone, uh, you know, a young journalist, a uh, female reporter in India, and they would um, ask us to display their job on our job board and we would charge them a fee. So the idea was to monetize it on the employer side and not on the candidate side. Uh, but again, I wouldn't say that it has been very successful. We have received very few uh, requests from uh, companies and employers to advertise uh, their jobs. And also the fee that we charge is not a lot because uh, we again realize that people are not willing to pay much uh, for this kind of uh, advertisement. Uh, so again, I would say not hasn't been very successful. Coming to membership. Okay. So now in India, um, there has been kind of a boom um, in, uh, sorry, boom in, you know, in these kind of platforms, uh, media platforms. So there are a lot of uh, media platforms today, which are digital. Uh, I would also say that we do have some competition. We are not the only uh, feminist platform in India today. So uh, when it comes to business, you also have to uh, factor in that point that there is competition and similar people. I mean, uh, uh, many people are applying for a similar, uh, you know, position or uh, or for the same client. Um, so that's one. And second is um, there are quite a lot of newer platforms that have started subscriptions or membership programs. I have also subscribed to two of them myself. Um, but yes, it is still a very new and growing concept of subscribing to platforms or becoming members to support them. So uh, it has again a very, very uh, slow and I would say small uh, market. And again, you know, very uh, urban restricted. Um, and one thing that we realized with membership is that for us, the first couple of weeks uh, was very good uh, when a lot of people signed up. But after that, it has just like been going uh, down. So it also tells you that, you know, the people who want to support you have done that and you have exhausted that pool. So like beyond that, now there are no more people who are willing to support you monetarily. Like they would support you maybe in other ways, but not that much that they would monetarily support you. So uh, there was a very, uh, I would say weird pattern in the sense that when we started in January, uh, there was like a rise and, you know, we got a lot of memberships and then, you know, there was a very sharp fall in the membership. So it showed us that 
there were a bunch of people who wanted to support us and they all did in the beginning and that's about it so yeah not very hopeful on the membership program for now but we are still uh, we are actually trying to understand what has what went wrong so currently uh, because it's been almost a year now uh, we are doing a survey with our current members to understand uh, what it is that they like about the program what they don't like how they would like to change it etc so we are hopefully trying to you know by next year uh, then revamp the membership program to understand how uh, this will work but uh, just to summarize this entire thing i would still focus most on clients and brand collapse because for the you know sure um return like the, the you know the amount that we can charge uh, and the sheer return on investment that it has uh, it's good to have a thriving membership program also because it means that those people really want to support you but financially it's not going to support the organization um, i would say it's good uh, as a whole for the organization but financially it's not viable um, so you like we would definitely want to focus on our brand collaborations. Yes, uh, that's true. For us also, uh, advertisement is like, yeah, it's very peanuts. It's even less than peanuts. I was saying that this this can buy us maybe like, you know, maybe a, a bowl of meatball, which which would be like French fries in the US probably, you know? So um, uh, we've, I mean, it's there. We, we still put uh, advertisements you know, advertising in, in our YouTube and as well as uh, on uh, Google ads on our uh, website. We set it so that it won't, uh, it won't um, put up uh, advertising that is related to cigarettes or uh, whiten, you know, whitening kind of skin products or, you know, uh, diet pill and things like that. Uh, but uh, other than that, yeah, it's there. It's, we're not really doing much about it. Uh, it's not bringing us a lot of money or even money, <laughs> but um, so that's true. We actually, I think I think for media um, organizations like us, media platforms like us that are very uh, niche and, and um, even culturally in our location where, where we are, it's, it's still not, uh, you know, uh, gaining, I mean, it's, it's not big culturally, it's, it's still, it still has to, uh, is still struggle with kind of recognition or acceptance, you know, like fem the concept of feminism or gender equality. But uh, I think we uh, the sponsored or um, collaboration is uh, is something that would would um, that we could rely on. But it you know it it's also really uh, dependent on. Um, you know the brand's uh, willingness to be associated with us. Now I don't know about in India, but in Indonesia, there's you know there are you know it's still very brands are still very skittish when it comes to you know be associated with uh, something that is that veers too much from the convention. You know, like feminism would be in in within the indonesian context right uh and there's a lot of there's also like growing conservatism religious conservatism in indonesia and things like that and uh when you know the thing about our brand is that while it's growing and people now know at least people within the social media you know within this demography they know about magdalene they know what magdalene is it's also there's also a lot of haters. So um, you know when you go to Twitter, uh, there would be some some people who you know would associate with Magda, uh, associate Magdalene with a lot of things that they hate. <laughs> you know, like you know something pink, for example, came up, or or some uh, some content that other people produce, some articles, and they'd be like, oh, this is so Magdalene. You know, for us, it's like brand recognition, but it's also very negative brand recognition. So I, I, I don't, so I think this is also um, reflective of what brand will approach us or will work with us because it, it can be, uh, you know, something that is, uh, you know, that is 
um, you know, that provides a um, challenge for them or, you know, that might be not might compromise their brand. So I don't know if that also is your uh, issue uh, at the moment or is there a lot more, you know, recognition, recognition or acceptance within in a more kind of commercial space in India? Uh, thanks, Devi. It's exactly the same. Uh, no difference whatsoever. Uh, both when it comes to, comes to brand collaborations is that I think it's from both sides. The brand needs to be aligned with our values. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, for like they, they need to be willing. And for us also, we should be willing to yeah. work with that brand because a lot of like, for example, in India, there is a there's huge colorism and, you know, a fairness. There's a fairness fair skin obsession uh, and a lot of brands and especially Hindustan Unilever uh, sells fairness creams and they are targeted towards women, right? So let's say this brand comes to us and say, hey, you know, our audience is mostly women, your audience is mostly women, so why don't we collab and, you know, we work on a, a project. And that's something that we would not do because we don't want to be associated with a brand that uh, is selling uh, fairness and telling women that only if you have a whiter skin uh, will you be successful in life. And that's literally how they sell their advertisements show this woman who is brown looking and she's very sad in life and she doesn't have mm -hmm. a job and all that. And suddenly she starts using the screen and she becomes fair and white and then she gets a job and she's very successful in life. She gets a boyfriend and everything. So as a feminist organization, we would not want to be associated with this brand. So it's it's two ways that the brand should be willing to work with us and we should be willing to work with the brand. And, you know, our values need to align with each other. And secondly, with respect to trolling, that's, <laughs> I, I just, I can't stop nodding uh, to everything <laughs> that you're saying. I feel like I'm going to get a headache later. <laughs> but uh, we have so much negative uh, trolling and we have negative brand uh, recognition. Uh, we have been called so many names. I can't tell you. If you go to YouTube and Google Feminism in India, there are YouTube videos made about us uh, by right wing <laughs> people in India trolling us and harassing us. So yeah, it's it's the same story. There's I don't know. I don't think I need to elaborate. <laughs> I can uh, sympathize with you. Yeah. There is a question uh, in the chat. Evelyn, should we start yeah. looking at the yeah. questions? Yeah, well, yes, definitely. But um, I had a question myself because of the last okay. bit of what you were talking about both. Thank you, by the way. Um, it, it, when I was talking to you early, Devi, you really explained or told me a little bit about how you uh, changed your own branding a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, as well as worked on relationship building. Uh, which also gave you a little bit of a boost in this native advertisement. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it was actually started last year, um, you know, when we just started uh, because of the pandemic that sent us back home and, you know, all of our planning that year just kind of went awry and, and we had to like, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of depressing stuff happening, but it's also a lot of thinking, a lot of led us to a lot of reflection. And at the same time, also last year, we, we started getting a lot of attacks online. And uh, our website was hacked for you know many days, for weeks even, and and our site would would you know would be down for for maybe a, you know the whole night, maybe four or five hours a night, which is like devastating for a small site like us. It affect really affect our traffic, and so we started just the head and I was you know talking about how we can you know what kind of learning that we can apply, and we really need some we really need to speak to outsiders, you know, to people who are actually outside of our bubble of feminists to know what you know what they think of us and how we can actually improve you know our appeal uh you know because we want to widen our appeal we want to go beyond the feminist uh you know bubbles which we already i think we we already have you know um by then we already are engaged with and um, so um, we we talked to a friend of our, ours whose sister was actually a brand uh, consultant and she consulted us for very small money. <laughs> I think she felt very sorry for us. So we did some, you know, workshopping and then we came up uh, what were our takeaway from the whole practice, the whole exercise, which actually involved our whole team. Uh, was that uh, we do need to um, 
adjust our uh, communication, our messaging, because um, yes, uh, we, you know, feminism is as it is, there's still so much baggage, so much stigma attached to it that we, we are just, you know, we're talking to a wall if we insist on, uh, uh, you know, messaging the way we were doing. So uh, we need to, you know, we, we need to uh, be more of a service, not as a who we are, you know, because at the time it's like, this is us, we are feminists and blah, blah, blah. But then we need to turn it around and say, this is what we do. You know, this is how you can, you know, benefit from this, you know, this is, so it's, it's very much a service thing. And so that uh, influence our, uh, you know, the way we approach our content, you know, in, in um, you know, in articles and as well as social media. I think social media is really big because that's where we get, that's where, uh, you know, we get a lot of uh, um, opportunity to actually uh, sell because a lot of the advertisement now comes through social media and also a lot of uh, opportunity to widen our reach as well, especially uh, Instagram. And um, so what we do is that we focus more on the engagement part. We focus more on the, you know, we, we create the persona of Magdalene as, you know, a very kind of, of your, your feminist friend, your sister, who is not gonna judge you, who is there if you need help, who, you know. So this kind of thing, this, this persona, I think uh, uh, allows us to be, um, uh, to, to be, uh, to provide what, or, or to manifest what our mission is, which is to, you know, to educate, engage, and, you know, all this other stuff, empower, and all this other stuff. And, uh, and uh, it also sends us to a different approach of journalism, which we call uh, constructive journalism, which we are actually, uh, at the time, we call it solution-driven journalism. But now uh, I think it's in a, I think of it in a more kind of umbrella term, which is constructive journalism, which we are now actually developing with the Constructive Journalism Institute in Denmark. Um, and, and the whole thing that why we do that is because I think uh, the media uh, has been in, in the space, in the spectrum of whatever it is, whether it's left or right, you know, conservative or whatever, there is so much things that are not reaching both sides uh, or that are not reaching the ones in the middle because there, there's a lot of, you know, you are either this or that, there's not a lot of conversation going. So by, uh, uh, by introducing or adopting this constructive journalism, we wanna, we wanna uh, you know, uh, we're, we wanna bring this or uh, we wanna help this, uh, the feminist intersectional feminist values that we that you know we believe that we adopt that that is uh, the core or the dna of our uh, of our uh, platform and um you know distribute it to wider mass and make it a lot more uh you know acceptable or accessible i think accessible is the is the now and since then uh, going back to the business side since then i think um because a lot of our content uh, uh, engage people and creates conversation, then we start getting uh, people to come to us, and you know we're starting getting all this, uh, you know, uh, partnership. Whether you know just placing ads, you know, maybe a, a couple of carousel on Instagram, or even big, you know, big campaign like the ones that I was telling you about, and it's or. And it, it's also easier for us to approach uh, an organization or a brand to, um, you know, to ask for collaboration or something like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but go a long way to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, Captain, you were uh, asking about the Q and A. So I have a question here. Um, you both mentioned you also receive grants from donor organizations and foundations. How are the conditions of these grants and does it support your institutional costs or is it mostly project or campaign related? Well, I can can answer that. Okay, sure. Thanks. Uh, so it's both. Uh, it depends on the funder. Uh, we have uh, both kind of grants currently. We have one funder which uh, 
is a no questions asked you know they don't care what we do with the uh, money and we are free to spend it the way we would like uh, and we have another funder who is very specific on what we are doing and uh, the kind of content that we are publishing so they actually also review the content that we publish uh, they review our articles and videos and everything uh, basically that, that we do with their money so yeah it's it's a mix of both yeah, same here. Um, we had uh, you know, the ones that I was telling you about MDIF that actually helps us organizationally. Organizationally, uh, so we propose you know where the money is gonna go, which is basically to create team, you know, for uh, expenditures and all these other things. And then we also get grants for projects which are tied to project. Like uh, we have one with investing in women, uh, which is an initiative of the Australian government in the region, uh, in the Southeast Asian region, and and in Indonesia they have several partners, and we we pitch and we and we were we won that, and so that pro project uh, or the program runs for two years, and uh, that one is quite specific on the project, and but basically uh, we propose. Uh, the components, all the components of the program to propose all the activities and they they just, you know, uh, they have to approve it. But then as we are doing it, they're not really, you know, uh, inter interfering into, uh, you know, whatever we are doing, uh, unless it like really directly involved them, like whether like when we uh, when we held an, a two day event, like a big event, and uh, they, you know, their name would be there big and stuff and they would send uh, the, uh, you know, one, uh, a representative to, to give a speech. So then that would, you know, they would really want to see, uh, you know, the rundown and all this, the content, all the, the other stuff. But, but for editorial content, they're not really um, like, uh, really interfering, uh, micro managing the whole thing, but they do have to agree to the concept, to the proposal, and uh, you know all this other stuff. And then we also have projects that are um, that are tied to uh, training and uh, journalistic project. Uh, like uh, we are uh, getting support from the IMS uh, uh, from Denmark, and uh, that is tied to to you know training for journalistic and also the journalistic project that comes after the training so there are different diff different um uh arrangement uh or nature of the grants um Devi, i realized and i forgot to ask you um I, how big is your team and are you a for-profit or not-for-profit yeah, we are for profit. From the beginning, we uh, we decided that we are up for profit because uh, although I don't have any business background, I also never have any kind of you know NGO background, and I have no idea at the time how to to write a proposal, even you know, to to get grants and stuff like that. So we decided it would be for profit, and yes, we haven't got profit yet. Uh, the our business, uh, our team, our whole team uh, right now is 13, 13 people. But it will be uh, fewer in uh, by the end of the year because uh, two of our <laughs> staff have just resigned for different reasons. Um, and uh, maybe I would say one one person is full time uh, doing business, and the other another person doing um, uh, doing what do you call it uh, engagement or community. And, uh, but then we also work with uh, external team that does business for, uh, that, you know, does a lot of marketing for us. And, uh, and you know, they, aside from like uh, some retainer, they also get commission if they get us something. So. Okay. Uh, just another quick follow-up question, if we have two or three minutes. Uh, so... Okay, thanks. So since you are registered as a for-profit company, is that a challenge when it comes to applying for uh, grants and uh, from foundations? Because that is definitely a challenge for us that a uh, lot of funding, because you know I explained earlier that uh, India doesn't have a kind of legal recognition where we can say that we are a social enterprise. Um, so, uh, a lot of we, we are unable to apply to a lot of grants because we are not registered as an NGO. 
uh, and uh, sometimes uh, people expect higher uh, you know salaries or incomes or you know uh, from us because they think that we are a for profit company and we are a huge company but the problem is we are neither so we are in the middle of both uh, but because it doesn't really have any kind of legal recognition um, uh, it's really difficult a lot of times you have to explain to funders why we are not for profit there, there are also other reasons uh, you know uh, con like that, that i actually cannot talk about uh, since this is being recorded uh, but yeah there are some other uh, reasons uh, why it's difficult to operate as a media organization um, you know as a non profit in india and um, so yeah we have had challenges with respect to that and i wanted to understand since mm -hmm. you mentioned you have grants from denmark and mdif and you have been working with the australian government mm -hmm. so um, do you also face this challenge yeah there's also no legal recognition for social uh, enter enterprise i think if i'm not mistaken i don't think there is um i think they will be treated as a, a for profit company like legally um so we are for profit company and uh and yes we have had uh several I mean many many opportunities that we had to miss because uh we're not you know we're, uh, we're not qualified for that because we are for profit there was even like you know there uh, i have been offered of you know working with a foundation you know using their kind of entity to get this but a lot of it, like you said, it's like the, with the ROI, we, you know, with the small team that we have, I don't think we, you know, we we are we can spend our energy and time for those, you know. So we we yeah we missed out on those opportunities. Okay, that that's it from my side. Okay, is there any more? Uh, do we have more time, uh, or should we? Uh, well, I, I would not want to stop you. So if you have more <laughs> to discuss, please go ahead. Um, no, I think I'm, I'm pretty much. Uh, yeah, I think Japan has answered a lot of my questions. All my questions. So, um, you have. if there is um, anything else you would like to discuss in the future, I can, of course, provide you with each other's contact details. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I can do after the session if that's something that you would like. Yeah, definitely. I would like to be in touch. Okay. Maybe I want to ask one question to Jacqueline. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, with all the challenges that we have, that we've both faced as, you know, the very niche feminist media organizations, uh, business-wise, um, how do you see, like, what, do you still see opportunities ahead? Like, what keeps you going? <laughs> Oh God, <laughs> I really was hoping that that wouldn't be your question. <laughs> it's, you know, it's really difficult, I would say. And, you know, I, I'm not someone who, uh, you know, how like the startup culture is, oh, you have to always speak about your dreams and aspirations and, and how motivated you are as a founder. And I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on founders. And I am someone, I don't even have a co-founder. So, you know, for me, this journey is quite lonely, I would say, uh, because it's just me. Uh, and although I have a very good and supportive team, but as you say, people come and go. I've also had someone who is very good at her work, but resigned very recently. And that was heartbreaking. Uh, but um, as the boss and as the founder of the organization, you have to learn to let go and also not take these things personally. So I would say definitely that it is a very, very difficult journey, especially when you are doing it by yourself. Um, and regarding the, <laughs> the question on hope, so why not? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to answer that because <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's it's a really, uh, yeah, I, I, I would refrain from answering that. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I mean, it's really good to know that um, that you are feeling this way. That I'm not alone. That yes, I I get you. I mean, even my co-founder has uh, decided to join <laughs> to to work somewhere else. So um, she's no longer involved, like in our daily activities anymore. Even though she still she still has share in the company. So I'm actually alone, <laughs> and uh, and yes, it's a very lonely road. Uh, but you know, I 
I really don't know what keeps me going sometimes. Uh, but, you know, it does make me happy when, uh, you know, when the campaign is going and when we are actually making money, not just so a lot of people think that because we are, you know, doing feminism, intersectional feminism, that we don't care about money. But I do care because I have staff that I have to feed. <laughs> exactly. And, so it does give me, a, you know, some purpose in life as well, other than, you know, the message that I'm sending the world. So maybe that, yeah. that's another thing just on that point. Uh, this is just going on and on uh, is uh, so when we started doing brand collabs and, you know, on now on Instagram and all these other apps, you have to mention if a post that you're making has been sponsored by someone by some brand. Right. It's it's a guideline mm -hmm. by Instagram. So we started doing that and a lot of our audience got offended by it. They, they were angry oh, yes. off and they're like, uh, why are you selling feminism? Is this what you're supposed to do now? Uh, what about the cause of... And I'm like, do you realize uh, what goes into creating this? Like, have you ever asked this question? How is this team sustaining itself when we have for years and we are a you know six seven year old publication uh, first i was doing it as a side hobby then we started operation mm -hmm. etc so so we have been creating content for seven years and for seven yeah. years nobody asked this question hey how are you doing this like so it it really pisses me off when people say oh now uh, you are selling feminism or you are you know you are making money uh, on the basis of social cause and mm -hmm. My, my response to that is everything needs money. Movements also need money. Like, I'm sorry, but that's the kind of world that we live in that, you know, that's the capitalist world that we live in that everything needs money. So yeah. uh, expecting that just because we work um, on a social cause, we work for women and gender minorities doesn't mean that, you know, uh, we don't need to pay our bills and pay our salaries. So we have had received criticism from our own audience uh, yeah. because we have started working with brands. And it just boggles my mind because nobody is also signing up for the membership. So you have the opportunity <laughs> to support the organization. You are also not doing that. But then you also have the audacity to come and ask why the organization is working with brands. So, you know, it's really, it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hear you. I mean, that totally, it's the same with us. It's, you know, we have a lot of people saying that we are, you know, liberal feminists and all this stuff, you know, <laughs> hurling insults at us. But, you know, like, like what you said, you know, people are actually working on this, you know, they spend, you know, what, how many hours a day to work on this messaging, you don't think that deserves to be paid, <laughs> you know, so I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, I'm really glad that you, you're mentioning that and that this is being uh, recorded. So I think <laughs> that the struggle is the same and uh, that people will understand that, you know, everything we do have to support the cross, you know, it's not for free, you know. Yes, some things are, you know, not everything, you know, even if it's a social cost, you do need to, to spend some money, especially for people who work on it, you know, who's been spending their time and energy and brain and you know all this other stuff so thank you for answering that <laughs> thank you um, i would honestly love to have this conversation going but i have to go now yeah uh, but it was really lovely talking to you devi and thank you evelyn so much for organizing this i really enjoyed and it was just nice i think for me this was like a venting call where i could just <laughs> speak about things that frustrate me as a feminist entrepreneur <laughs> Thank you. It's nice talking to you too, Jacqueline. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank uh, you both for sharing. I will exchange your info and uh, yeah, that would be thank great. You thank you so much. You.